Welcome back, movie fans, to another episode of Hollow Victories, where movies like Cats and Dogs can fight like cats and dogs. I am your host, Matt Presents, joined, as always, by my animal co-host. Hello, my name is Alvin Fling, but by night, I become Mackle, and I don't act the same even remotely. I might, you might as well consider me a completely different person, in fact. Yeah, that checks out. And today, we, we are doing the matchup of very low budget talking animal movies uh quite infamous like like there's the, these talking animal movies are dime a dozen but these two in particular have, have gained like a lot of attention uh it, it's david dakota's a talking cat versus love on a leash from 2011 directed by one miss finn tian i hope i'm saying that even close to right <laughs> In terms of, like, online reviewers, I'd say, like, no question, Ralph Seppe is the one who popularized Love on a Leash. Um, yeah. A Talking Cat is a little bit more op up in the air, because I've seen a lot. John Tron is probably the most popular. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I was gonna say this, but, like, A Talking Cat feels like the type of weird, cheap, obscure thing that I would cover on Matt's Funtime Weird Movie Show, except... Everyone has reviewed it. Fucking, like, JonTron did it, Nostalgia Critic did it, Cinema Snob did it, Obscurus Lupa did it. I did, uh, I Hate Everything did it too, didn't he? I wouldn't be surprised. Am I wrong? I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, let me look that up. I'm not seeing it, but also it's giving no. me, it's not even giving me his channel, so, when I googled it, so it's probably just, uh, doing a bad job of searches again. I f someone else, someone else who was like kind of popular, reviewed it. Anyway, you you want to dive into this? You want to introduce a talking cat for us, Michael? Yeah, sure. A talking cat is an indie family movie released in twenty thirteen, directed by a David Dakota. Um, and sure. it, <laughs> did, I, did I pronounce it all right? Or <laughs> uh, it's generally Dakota. I think that's how I usually hear it pronounced. Although. I'm not even sure if that's right. That could be wrong. That's just how everyone I know pronounces it. <laughs> right. Uh, I actually, he's. I've seen him in movies where they called him David Dakota. So, yeah, I feel like that's right. Yeah. Um, the movie is about a uh, talking cat who can only talk to each person once in an attempt to bring them together and help them out. We have two different families. Uh, one is just a single father living with with his son in this, like, really fancy but horribly decorated house. Uh, he just stopped, you know, he just retired from his uh, job, his very success, successful business. On the other side, you have a mother and her two kids, single mother and two kids. So, like, the cat's main goal in this movie is just kind of bringing them together. Uh, but then also, oddly enough, bringing the two sons together. So the cat's a little fucked in the head. Um you know, trying to make this, like, a family where, like, you know, I guess it wouldn't technically be incest since they're not related, but still it's a little odd to try to bring, like, a fa like every member of the family together that way. Imagine if your dad started dating your boyfriend's mother. Right. You ever hear the song, I'm My Own Grandpa? Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm familiar. Yeah, it's kind of like that scenario. Um, you also have a girl who's being tutored by, um, the, the dad's son, uh, who looks identical to the mother's, uh, the single mother's daughter. So Matt didn't know they were a different character until the very end of the movie where they're on screen together. I've seen this movie three times and I legit thought the girl getting tutored was the sister from the other family. Until, like, the end of the movie where there's two girls standing there and I'm like, who's this other girl? Where did she come from? They look alike and the characters are both generic enough to where it's kind of believable because, like, one's just, like, like one's trying to study, one wants to get into business school. Um, you could say, like, her being, like, a little bit rebellious at his house. Like, really not even, like, they treat it like she's being rebellious. Really, she just wants to hop in the pool. Um... But that could be, like, just trying to get away from her mother and also it's Like, it still all adds up as the same character. Yeah. I, I, to be fair, I am also, like, kind of face blind. I, I will just mix people up sometimes. Yeah, I didn't do that in this movie, but I hear ya. 
Like, it makes sense to me. I don't think it's, like, the most outrageous thing ever that you thought it was the same person. Because it's like, yeah, I can kind of see that. Um, yeah. So what do you, how do you feel about a talking cat, Matt? I feel like I've given I, a good enough summary. I really like a talking cat. I think this is a very fun, bad movie. Because here's the thing, like, I, I mentioned that these talking animal movies are, like, a dime a dozen, and they absolutely are. David Dakota himself has made a lot of them. But this one, like, it's got a really generic script, but the presentation is just so off. That, right. <laughs> that it becomes very funny. I think every single cast member in this, and I do mean every... It's a rare instance where we watch a bad movie where I think every single cast member is bringing something to the table. They are all the most awkward people in existence, <laughs> and every single one of them is funny. Every single one of them. The cat's funny, the dad's funny, the mom's funny. None of it's supposed to be funny, but it, everybody just looks so uncomfortable the whole time. Like the mother and the father almost have like a little bit, like a little bit more charisma than the others. But then they have scenes where like he accidentally knocks a tray of cheese puffs over, and she like legitimately gets angry. <laughs> and it's just so one, uncomfortable. She fucking reaches into the oven, pulls the pan out with her bare hands, <laughs> and then he touches it, and he's like, "Ow, it's hot." <laughs> Like, how did she pull it out then? Maybe she was supposed to get an oven mint in that, in that scene and she forgot to and they just didn't notice until post. Prop department just, like, they, they <laughs> forgot to pick up oven mitts and it's like, ah, we, like, we're, we're not waiting half the day to get oven mitts, just film it. Yeah, it's just, a, it, it's like, it should be the most boring thing ever, but I agree with you. It's presentation, like, really just kind of makes it a, funny movie to watch i don't think it gets old i i feel like the i don't think the novelty of it dies uh, before the movie ends i i do think there's maybe like a spot or two where it drags i don't think this is the funniest thing we've shown no but it's, de it's definitely i no, mean it's up there it's definitely no mac mac and me or uh book of henry but i, I i'd say it's like top 15 maybe top i'd 10? say top I, I I think I have it top five even. Maybe you have it a little lower than me, but I, I have it pretty high. I'm I'm confused by my own list because I try to like do a mix of what I enjoyed and and some some objective qualities, but it's just a I don't know, it's a fucking mess. I probably should just rank it completely by enjoyment <laughs> and nothing else. Um it's mainly enjoyment, but I don't know, like because I I do enjoy competent filmmaking, so even though um, barbed wire bored the shit out of me for most of it, it's still like fairly well made, so it's high up. I get you. But a talking cat is a million times more entertaining than barbed wire. Absolutely, unquestionably. And I I I liked barbed wire more than you did, but uh, yeah, if I had to pick which one of these I'm gonna watch again, of course it's gonna be a talking cat. I've been thinking about doing a video on Movie Mac where it's just like the top 10 Hollow Victories characters, just praise and 10 characters <laughs> that made these movies tolerable to sit through. And I will say, one of the ones I'm considering for the top 10, because I was thinking of doing top 10 worse too, as much as I wasn't into Barbed Wire, I actually do think one of the characters in Barbed Wire could be on that top 10. <laughs> oh, what, what is it? Where do we even begin with this? Uh, I guess we could talk about the the house that it's filmed in because this is like a house you could just rent out for like filming stuff mm -hmm. in la at least up until like, i think they sold it in like 2013 2014 but uh it appears in like a bunch of david dakota movies it appears in a couple other pretty cheap productions and it appears in like a handful of pornos <laughs> like this was just a place people would rent to film porn and you know it, it, honestly like it's possible dakota directed some of that porn yeah uh, not likely not likely but possible because uh, he has he has like a whole string of movies the 1313 series which is is named that so that it will pop up first on alphabetical lists on streaming services the 1313 movies which are Basically just softcore gay porn. I reviewed Bigfoot vs. D.B. Cooper, which is pretty much a 1313 movie in 
all but name. Like, they don't put the 1313 branding on it, but otherwise it follows, like, the general structure of a 1313 movie. Because, like, half the film is just buff dudes getting down to their underwear and posing. Right. Dakota, very known for his homoeroticism. <laughs> like, to the point they... the the a, a, a movie I reviewed, Ginger Dead Man 2, the whole thing was sort of like a send-up of Full Moon Pictures, the company that made it. And it's not good, it's not funny, but, like, the one joke that I really liked, that I really laughed at, I'm like, okay, that's a good joke. But it's only good because I know who David Dakota is. <laughs> is like, the one of the characters meets David Dakota, and he's like, whoa, David Dakota, his movies are known for their, you know, wild sci-fi worlds. And so subtle homoeroticism and then like a dude walks up in just like a thong and wings and that's it and it's like how do you th what do you think of this costume love it <laughs> uh i'm looking at i'm looking at some like stuff with the involved in the house just like going back to what you said before about it uh it was used in a tim and eric skit oh yeah yeah i forgot that <laughs> um and yeah then there's some porns showing up here yeah a lot of a lot of movies uh <laughs> Shot of someone strangling someone in that house. The fucking leg tree that almost makes the joke where he walks up and says, this thing is awful. What was I thinking? It better since it appears in so many movies. So good good yeah. joke at Talking Cat. That's very clever. It's it's commentary. It's actually a smart movie. Let's watch a talking pony. <laughs> Surely it will be just as good. Um, It has Johnny Whiptaker the dad in a talking cat uh voice him the talking pony Whitaker? Whitaker. interesting someone gave a talking cat a deviant art report card why would you even bother i don't think that there should be any sincere conversation about a talking cat you should just sit down and have a good laugh you don't need to explain what doesn't work about it to anyone because people have eyes <laughs> um uh, yeah i mean what what doesn't work about it feels pretty apparent I do think we should, like, at least mention, like, the terrible mouth animation. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it is, like, a defining feature of the movie. Like, there are, there are so many other ways you could make a cat talk. That is, like, the worst option. Yeah, that's, like, the option that I would have done in high school because I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> that's, like, the option I would do in a video as a joke. Right. I almost want to say just put like taking a doing the annoying orange approach would be better. <laughs> the fucking uh, uh, clutch cargo real life mouth on the cat. Right. Yeah. And it wouldn't be good, but it wouldn't just be a black circle opening and closing. Yeah. You know, I, I, I feel like any decision like that actually ruins a talking cat because making a talking cat better just kind of, in a way, it kind of makes it worse because it's already too late for it to be like a... Oh, no, I... A sincerely the, the, good movie. The mouth is bad, but, like, I'm glad they did it that way. <laughs> <laughs> like, it it adds to, like, the what the fuck is going on of this movie. Do you think that any of the other A Talk in Blank movies could be any good, or do you think that this movie just all of the right... Like, all of the wrong things came together in the right way? Um, hard to say. I, I think it's possible. I do think Dakota, e even at his worst, tends to be, like, kinda interesting. He has made some, like, decent stuff. He made Puppet Master 3, which is the best Puppet Master movie. <laughs> and he also... This is a movie I have not seen, but that I really want to watch. It's called Leather Jacket Love Story, and it's his, like, one genuine bid to, like, ma make a serious drama. Because mostly what he did was, like, like for a long time it was, like, low-budget horror, and then, like, slowly it's become, like, low-budget animal movies and low-budget, like, borderline softcore porn. Mm -hmm. But uh, Leather Jacket Love Story was his one, like trying to be serious movie so i'm right. kind of interested in seeing that i i have actually heard decent stuff about it interesting it's also his like one openly gay movie oh uh -huh. maybe uh maybe if we ever cover him again uh out of the ring 
I let's let's dive into cast, and I'm sure we will find other things to say while we are talking about these actors and their characters. Yeah. Okay. Can I take a moment to complain about the fact that both of us have, like, the squeakiest chairs? Yeah. Like, I am always editing these, and it's just like, squeak, 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 squeak. Yeah, I'm trying to stay still because of that, but it's also hard to do that. I try to only move when you're talking, and I can cut the audio, but... Right. Yeah, It doesn't no. always work. Like, sometimes I'll get really animated saying something, and it's like, well, that was a bad idea because half of it is drowned out by squeaks. You got Johnny Whitaker as Phil, who weirdly was, like, a child star and then, like, disappeared for decades and then reappeared in in stuff like this. Oh, fuck. I'd, he, he was in a movie I just watched recently is uh, called Mystery in Dracula's Castle, an old, like, Disney, Disney movie of the week. I, I really liked him in that, actually. I didn't know that was him. I didn't realize huh. it was, like, the kid in that is the dad in this. Interesting. Yeah, it's kind of, like, you know, unfortunate because now A Talking Cat is, like, one of his most notable movies. If you, like, click on his list, it's, like, the, up there at the top. I didn't know I didn't know he was in stuff, like, in a lot of other stuff. He's not in a lot of other stuff. It huh. mostly looks like... I, I mean, it mostly looks like Disney stuff. He was, like, a Disney child star. Right. Yeah, he he was in... The last thing he was in was a TV pilot in 1977. Then he appeared... I Probably just in archive footage. This looks like a documentary in the 90s. And then it's a talking cat. It's 1977 and then a talking cat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he played Santa in A Husband for Christmas. I think he's one of the funniest characters in the movie. I think his performance is... Uh... I don't yeah. know. There's the I think I think his soul patch is weird. It is weird. And it's, it's a like, very it's a very like two thousand one soul patch. Like this is this is what like Fred Durst and the lead singer of Smash Mouth had. He he, he kind of cracks me up in the movie because he seems like generally a nice person in the movie, you know, but like no one respects him at all. Except for, like, the one girl going to business school, like, at the end of the movie. Because she's like, oh, shit, you're this person. You can teach me. And, uh, but everyone else is just, like, sick of his shit all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, the the lady likes him. Like, yeah. clearly there's, like, a budding romance there. But, like, the slightest slip up and she is like, oh, my God, I, you're so ter- You need to leave. <laughs> Get the fuck out of my house. I, he... <laughs> He wears a shirt in this that says one fucking day at a time in Spanish in this children's movie. Because <laughs> no children speak Spanish. Christine DeBell, she was someone who was also like in a bunch of stuff back then, like a younger actress. Uh, she Now for her, it looks like she never really... Actually, no, 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 no. It, yeah, yeah, there's a gap between 1990 and 2012 for her. But uh, it seems like she's she's done more since she's come back. Uh, but it, it, she she has done some notable stuff. She was in a Jackie Chan movie. She was in Meatballs. She's actually actually like a major role in Meatballs too. What the hell? She was also in a, a, a X rated version of Alice in Wonderland. That's what I was about to bring up. So I guess she wasn't that young of an actress when she started, because that's like her first project listed here, except for I guess except for television. It was her first, like, big role. And it's kind of interesting to see her, <laughs> see that, because it's just not the type of character you're like, you see the, this character she's playing, it's not not what you expect her to be doing in the past. I mean, yeah, but also, like, kind of no, because I I know David Dakota, and I know the types of people David Dakota right. casts in his movies. <laughs> right. <laughs> Honestly, I'm surprised it wasn't some, like, B-list 80s scream queen. Janice... Peebles as which one? I gotta okay. She's the daughter. She's the daughter. I think she's the least interesting character in terms of like doing weird what what is going on stuff. Yeah, I kind of like her reaction to the cat talking though. Yeah, but that I mean that's, that, that's the just mom, like the, the dialogue is like so weird. She's, she's like, "You're a cat," and he's like, "I'm a talking cat." <laughs> And that's, like, the first thing he says. I think the funniest part about that scene even more so comes from 
the mom because she's like having this breakdown and she the mom's just ignoring it completely saying why is there a cat in here it talked to me mom <laughs> are you listening to what i'm saying well, there's a cat in here. <laughs> he like just—it's not even, not even like she. she it, it's almost as if she actually cannot hear what she's saying. Mom, the cat was talking. Where did this cat come from? What's <laughs> up with this cat? Why is there a cat in here? Like, who cares that it can talk? Why is it here? Mister Justin Cone as the the son, the businessman's son. Chris is the character. I would never in a million years guess that character's name was Chris. <laughs> My favorite scene of him is there's a scene where he storms up the stairs, but because it's a spiral staircase, he shows back up on camera while going up them. My favorite scene is when he gets in the pool with the other dude. That's, and that's, it's like that's a good one. Super gay. Because they're clearly trying to set him up with the girl he's tutoring, but not only does that not really continue after that scene, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, that, that's not actually, that's really all I have to say about that. That arc does not continue after the pool scene they just kind of drop it it just isn't a thing yeah, anymore yeah, no there's just there's a scene where he's like dad what do you do when you like a girl and then the girl shows up and that's that's the last we hear of it he has way more chemistry with the dude yeah i mean he just seems uncomfortable around her I, but i mean he seems he seems really gay though. right like i hate to i hate to be like that but like this dude, this dude seems gay. This dude is gay as hell. Like, the other dude, if you if, if you had cast the other dude in this movie as the son, I'd be like, okay, maybe he's straight. But then, no, this, this dude is gay, and then the other dude shows up and gets topless, and he's just, like, <laughs> like, he's awkward about it, but awkward about it in a way where it's, like, clear he's kinda into it. Yeah, the... <laughs> The other character, Trent, I want to talk about because out of all the kid characters, like the ch you know, I don't think any, I don't think any of them are actually children in this movie, but they're like their kids. Uh, he's probably my favorite, like favorite one. He is so fucking funny to me because he comes off as such a dipshit in the movie, and I don't think it's intentional. It's like little <laughs> things, like the prop department. It's like her picking up like the hot, uh, the, like the thing out of the stove, and then there's a scene where he's like. I think he's, like, trying to repair the fence, but the, like, tools he are, he's using aren't plugged in. Like, he, he, he's just, he's just out there for hours. Fucking useless himbo. He is just here to be eye candy. And, and also, like, the arguments he gets into with his sister would be better, uh, like, better said by a ten-year-old in one of these movies. What? Well, some of them are weird, because, like... I mean, first off, it's weird that, like, her mom is like, no, you're too smart and talented to go to business school. Right. And then he walks in and just immediately is like, stop bothering mom about business school. <laughs> he's like, he's, she's going to get in trouble, right? <laughs> oh, he's so excited when she's going to get in trouble. <laughs> And then he shows up to gather his sister like he's supposed to be the good boy, but instead takes his shirt off and gets in the pool. <laughs> he doesn't really have an arc. They're kind of try. It feels like they're trying to give him one where he's trying to figure his life out, but it's like so rarely focused on. But that's like every character in this movie. The The guy doesn't actually really get with the like the father doesn't really get with the mother at the end. Um, maybe they're hinting that it could happen. Uh, really, it's just the cat's trying, like, the cat's just instigating all this shit, and then he gets hit by a car, and then he lives, and that's where the movie ends. Like, uh, the, the, you know, the tutor kid doesn't get with the girl he's tutoring, or the guy that he went swimming with. Um, the, you know, uh, Tina, she could go to business school, it doesn't happen in the movie. Well, she, she gets a job with, uh, the, the one guy's company. Anyways, there's a cast member I've been deliberately leaving for last. Mr. Eric Roberts, Woo! the voice of Duffy, the fucking king of the one-day shoot. He will just show up for any fucking movie and film for a day. It doesn't matter if it's a talking cat or the Dark Knight. He's there for a day. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's why he ends up in so much stuff like this, because they're like... Ooh, Eric Roberts, he was in The Dark Knight. He's like a legitimate actor. 
Who was he in The Dark Knight right when you said that he sh- like he popped that movie popped up on his list for me? Uh, he's the bank owner at the very beginning of the movie. Okay. But yeah, I mean, he's been in, like, so much stuff, but he always has just, like, the smallest roles. It's like, yeah, I, I spent one day filming this. I mean, he's technically in Cool Cat. He recorded one of, like, the PSAs they play, like, after the end credits. He's just like, hi, I'm Eric Roberts, and you should read Cool Cat. Ah, oh, man. You know what's weird, though? Maybe it's just because they haven't found all of his movies yet, but 2023, one movie. Where every other year it's like movie after movie, but maybe it's just like his movies from this year haven't been discovered yet. Because <laughs> I'll say this, if you go for his Wikipedia list, you can't click on most of the movies he's in. <laughs> oh, there's so much. Yeah, there's so much shit here. There's like, this might be the biggest Wikipedia list I've ever seen for movies. It's just every single fucking oh, yeah. year, there is so much I, shit. He, I, I love seeing him pop up in anything like anytime he just has like a tiny cameo in a movie it's like ah, ha, ha, there he is it's eric roberts he was i in... love his cameo in the cable guy that's what i was about to say i don't think the cable guy is a very good movie but i love his cameo in it it says cable guy who was in wildflowers uh cable guy was eh, i saw it with my brother like like i years it's... ago it was whatever I understand, like, if, if people like it. It's just, I hate movies where it's just, like, a character decides to ruin someone else's life for no reason. No, I understand that. It can be annoying. Jim Carrey, I don't know. He, he was he was mildly entertaining to watch in that. Jack Black is good in that. Talking Cat's better. <laughs> I would rather watch a talking cat. <laughs> mm. A talking cat is, like... It's weird because of the movie we paired it up with. But this guy's fucking Emma Roberts' dad. Yes. Yes, okay. he is. So he's like, okay. Roberts is kind of like, not. it's a somewhat generic last name. A lot of people could have it. Uh, I don't even know if I've ever seen Emma Roberts do a single thing I liked. But uh, she's definitely a notable actor. Oh, I feel like she has done something I like. I just I kind of igno- avoid most of her stuff. It's mainly stuff my sister watches. Um, I remember watching uh, Aquamarine when I was a kid with my two sisters. Uh, Blow was good. You loved The Hunt, right? God, I don't even remember who she was in The Hunt. (laughs) I actually, I I appreciate The Hunt because I think my video on The Hunt is one of the best videos I've ever made. It was a good, it was a solid video. It was like an immediate, like, I have a video in mind. I know exactly what I want to say about this movie. (laughs) Well, do you have anything else to say about a talking cat? Because I, most of the stuff I want to continue to say about it involves talking about Love on a Leash, so we should probably just get to Love on a Leash. But what I was about to say is, like, it's such an incompetent movie. Like, it kind of feels like you watch a, t- uh, a talking cat and, like, production-wise, you kind of feel like this is about as bad as it can get, right? But you know what? There's a couple of shots that would look nice on a family vacation video. You know, like, they, they, they didn't necessarily do good camera work, but they found interest in places to film in. That's about as like as much as I can compliment it, but that's definitely better than what a fucking, lo- what fucking Love on a Leash did. It's like, it can't get much worse than this, and then immediately it's like, oh, it can. It absolutely can. It can get a <laughs> lot worse, in fact. And that isn't to say that uh, a talking cat wins, because at this point, I really feel like with these two more than anything, we're in it. this one is which one's funnier. Because what can you really compliment these two movies on from a production stance? Not not a lot. <laughs> they have horrible audio. They have horrible shot composition. They're not well written. It really comes down to which one's funnier. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you want to just move on? You want to you dive into Love on a Leash and then we can kind of hash out like the differences? Yeah. So, Love on a Leash uh, is a film about a man who has been turned into a dog by an evil witch who lives in the pond? Uh, and he, he is cursed to be a dog until he finds true love. It's kind of like Beauty and the Beast if the beast couldn't talk and was also just like a normal animal. He has to fall in love with a human woman. So, like, I, I feel like the, the witch has kind of cheated him on this one. But... He has to fall in love with a human woman, and he meets this woman 
Lisa. He he and Lisa are like getting along good, getting along well. And then about like 20 minutes in, he turns into a man. But then the witch is like, oh, you still don't love her enough. So you can only be a man during the daytime. Or he only gets to be a man at night. Excuse me. He only gets to be a man at night. And he has to be a dog during the daytime. So they have this weird relationship where they can only like do things at night. And he's like a dog the rest of the time. And, uh, I mean, I'm- I'm telling you, like, what happens in the movie. I think I'm failing to communicate how absolutely disjointed and nonsensical so much of this movie is. Because throughout that, you've got, like, you've got, like, uh, her, Lisa, trying to, like, date all these men and, like, him deliberately screwing up the dates. And then, like, he gets a- job as a dog model and apparently they're just like paying the dog in cash and <laughs> it's it's just it's such a weird movie man like nothing about this makes sense nothing about this movie makes sense yeah i look if i can give a talking cat anything is uh what what, what who's the movie for it's a uh, a children's movie maybe you could argue family movie about a silly talking cat all right what is love on a leash i have no fucking idea it's too raunchy to be like a kid's movie way too raunchy there's sex scenes in it but it's but it's like a weird like talking dog goofy animal movie there's decisions i understand don't agree with but understand like why the voice actor doesn't just play the human actor. I, I understand that, like, they wanted, like, a model, basically, to play the guy in live action, scene, like, when he's a human. But he probably didn't have a silly enough voice to voice the dog in the other scenes. And they're not going to get Alvin Fling's uh, voice actor to be the model, by any means. So, I, I, I get it. I don't agree with that. I think you should find someone who can do both so he doesn't sound and act like a completely different human being. When he's not a dog anymore. <laughs> yeah. But just when trying to, like, picture the entire, like, movie, I really, the only thing I can come to the conclusion of is it's like, this is a movie that belongs to the person who made it and no one else. This is all stuff that made sense to her and it's not going to make sense to anyone else. Because it is just fucking nonsense start to finish. And as a result, you get some really funny fucking shit there's a lot of parts that made me laugh in this. I'd say the two like b hardest laughs I remember getting is one. There's the scene where her mother calls her and like, it's just like a dark and creepily lit room. And it's actually like kind of a good shot because she has like backlight and it's like, she's in a dark room, but there's like this outline around her body and it's just unsettling as hell. And then the rest of the movie doesn't do that again. She's just kind of a bad mom in the rest of the yeah, movie. It's... She's not like a horror figure. Yeah, she's not, like, supposed to be, a, a like, a, she, she's not supposed to be, like, this terrible mother who's like, oh, God, mom is calling, oh, no. Just she and her <clears throat> friend come around all the time and are always talking to her about, like, getting married. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, do it, get, get married right in front of us, do it tonight. The other part that made me laugh really hard, I mean, I laughed a lot watching this, but I'm talking about, like, the, str like the two strongest ones was, I think, quite possibly the most inappropriate thing I've seen in a movie in my entire life. Where they have a scene where her boss breaks into her house and tries to force himself on her, only to be taken up by the dog, and now she's on the couch crying hysterically as the dog is singing about being a dog. <laughs> <laughs> so you just have these shots of him in the corner. I'm a dog, and I'm singing. And then she's meanwhile she's on the couch sobbing because she was just attacked in her own home. It's just like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> this this movie has the worst tone problem I have ever seen in any movie, and that's that's saying something. I have seen a lot of tonally confused movies. This film does not have a tone. It refuses to take a single tone. Right. Um, and you know what? It's pretty interesting as a result. I will give it that. It's not a boring movie. Granted, unlike A Talking Cat, I think this movie has higher highs than A Talking Cat. I got really bored by the end of this. Like, I had had, by the last 30 minutes, I had had enough. 
Yeah, it does start to lose steam near the end because it, it's it's all nonsense and it's kind it kind of starts to get repetitive, and then he gets hit by the car and you're like, hold up, no, nah, I'm invested again. Yeah, I think I think from the time he gets hit by the car to the end of the movie, it's it's just like like a whole new breed of what the fuck is happening. Right, and it like skips to like. You know, there's a time skip. It says years later, and you're thinking maybe like two to three years later. No, it's like forty years later, because uh, like her friend, her friend comes back not as a mother but a grandmother with kids who are like look like they could be like ten or eleven too. And yeah, and then and then he comes back, but he looks young, but then he looks old. <laughs> the ending to this makes no fucking sense. Like it makes less sense than anything else in the movie. I'm like. What is, what is this? Is this a happy ending? What happened? Like, he got, did he get reincarnated? But, like, now the the person he reincarnated as gets to be old because he's in love with her? <laughs> you know how disappointed she fucking looks when he becomes old, too? Like, her face, like, how just, like, the smile is wiped off completely when he, she looks old. I, I don't think that was intentional. I think that was just, like, the actress kind of... <laughs> just maybe shock instead of disgust. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I mean, clearly, it's that, that's not the intention. They get married and they're happy at the end, but it's just, like... <laughs> I remember that. That was another thing that got a laugh out of but me. It's just so... But it's such... It's not a happy ending. Oh, she they... went like 40 years without this dude. She thought this dude died and had to live with that for like 40 years. And what was he doing? Like, was he incapable of coming back or did he just choose <laughs> not to come back until that point? Yeah, right. Like, I, I thought this was going to be like... Because like in A Talking Cat, the cat gets hit by a car, but the cat lives. I forgot to mention the fucking bandage. The fucking bandage oh in that God. movie. So they just... They wrap like a single piece of gauze around the cat's head. It's hilarious. That's probably like, in a production stance, the one thing that Love on a Leash does better. Because one, they flat out have a shot where a car is coming at him. I'm like, I'm wondering how safe was that shot? Clearly the dog didn't I mean, get hurt, yeah. but clearly the dog didn't get hurt, but it definitely felt like they were being a little bit risky there. Um, cause that car's coming in fast and they did not, they do not have the editing skills to fake that. I know they actually shot that. Um, and then two, the dog, like they just kind of put a little mark on his forehead, but one that's better than the bandage and two, the dog, like, you know, lying on the road with a bunch of people surrounded at like, and it looks probably just tired in the shop. It's like, yeah, add all those things together. And it kind of does look like this dog is hurt right now. So that yeah. was, they did a better job than a talking cat in that regard. Yeah, a talking cat just has a car crash happen, like, off screen. <laughs> yeah, and the band is just, like, it's not just, on the head properly. It's just kind of, like, they just kind of dropped it on his head. Yeah, I, I kind of thought, like, okay, he's going to get hit by the car, but then he'll be, like, back to a human. Like, this is where, like, the witch turns him back to a human and, like, saves him because he truly loves the girl. Right. Which I gotta say, it's kind of ridiculous that, like, through 80% of this movie, it's just like, nope, you don't love her enough. Yeah. Well, honestly, it's like in every single fucking scene where he's the dog, he doesn't learn his lesson at all. There's a scene near the climax of the movie where she's drowning in a pool, and he complains that he has to save her. Yeah, I almost feel like... I, I feel like the dog stuff was maybe, like, improvised... Right. Because he feels like a completely different character when he's the dog. Oh, oh, also, I forgot to mention this. Like, he, he, he turns into a dog at night, but he, uh, he turns into a dog in the day, but only if the sun is on him. So there's a scene where, like, he's at, like, a party and it's, like, cloudy, but then, like, the sun comes out and he transforms into a dog. There's also nighttime scenes where he's clearly a dog still, but let's ignore that. That that's the scene where he like jumps in to save her. Yeah, and he, like he starts with like, "Oh, you you've like made me lose face in front of these people," and it's like, "What do you mean lose face? They saw you transform into a dog. That's not like embarrassing. That's concerning. <laughs> that's like yeah. holy shit! This man just turned into a dog. People don't react." properly in either of these movies no 
They, no, you're correct. <laughs> they, uh, God, just like, okay, let's just talk about the concept first, like, here alone, too. Like, how quickly she's willing to, you know, fuck the saw, <laughs> granted in human form. But it's like, it's still weird. And to be fair, like, be fair, like, this isn't the dog she's had very long. But, like, you know, when you have a bond with your pet, your dog, even if they turn into a human, even if they're, like, in human form, someone that it would be appropriate for you to hook up with, you're still kind of supposed to have that, like, dog and human bond to where it would still be fucking weird <laughs> to do that. Uh, like, Im- imagine if you yeah. had, like, a f- like, imagine if you had a family member morph into a different looking person. Oh, you don't look like this person anymore, so <laughs> let's get on. It's like, doesn't, it's bizarre, it doesn't work. And also, like, the the thing that incites him, like, finally getting to become a man sometimes is the girl being like, I'm off men forever. It's just you and me, Prince. And then he turns into, like, like the moment she's like, I'm not dating, I'm just gonna be happy with my dog. He's like, voila, I am a man, marry me. (laughs) Yeah, very bizarre movie. Very, very bizarre movie. Weird, weird movie. And then there's like scenes where they're having like just real conversations, like real uncomfortable conversations that are like, you know, I'm not going to act like they're like great or anything, but it's like in a different movie. It feels like it's a different movie briefly where like the one guy <laughs> is like asking her if she'll mar- like fake marry him um, because he's gay and he doesn't want his fa- family to know about that. And, like, you know, it's not like, again, it's not like I'm saying, oh, this part of the movie is, like, weirdly good and dramatic. It's just, like, it feels like it belongs somewhere else. It's, like, just such a, it's such a real, it's such a real conversation. That's what I can say about it. (laughs) It's another one of the film's tonal issues. Yeah, why, why was this the movie you chose to put in it? The only real way it connects to the storyline is she talks about true love in that scene. And great, but, I mean, I almost, like, the only way that's working is if, like, that relationship is a thing throughout the movie, and this is, like, a big reveal near the end of it. Uh, it's Even then, Love on a Leash probably isn't the right place to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, weirdly, the, the guy who played that dude, the, the, the one gay guy, just moving into cast very briefly. We don't have to, like, go in-depth with these guys. I do want to talk about one of them. He has, there is one we need to talk about. He has been in some stuff. He was in, like, Point Break, Pearl Harbor, The Hunt for Red October. Damn. Like, he he has been in some, like, notable stuff. Yeah. I mean, Shallon Soccer. I am looking at the right guy, right? That is the... Ping Wu. Fucking gay guy. Yeah. Yeah, it's him. Um, yeah, there's a lot of shit here. Like, uh, you know, some popular TV shows like NCIS, uh... Horrible bosses, too. Uh, I mean, showing... Like, every actor in L.A. is just constantly showing up on all of the cop shows. Right. Because they, they need new actors every week, so it's like, okay, yeah. uh... You need, like, ten different people for the investigation, and there's, like, so many fucking cop shows. Oh, my God. Without, yeah. f- without failure, there's always, like, at least 30 running at the same time. Probably more than that. We, uh, yeah, yeah. CSI and then CSI Miami and CSI New York and then you got like NCIS and NCIS LA and NCIS uh, Baton Rouge and then Las Vegas and <laughs> Law and Order is another yeah. one that has like a thousand of them Law that all order, run Law at the same order, time. SVU, Law and Order Chicago, <laughs> Chicago PD, Chicago PD LA, Paradise PD. Right, yeah, famous, <laughs> beloved. <laughs> Um, cherished. So yeah, I, I, the actor worth mentioning is the voice of the dog, Mr. Stephen Kramer Glickman, who was the manager on Big Time Rush. And you know, you know what? Like, I, I will say kind this: of a funny character on that show. Yeah, he had a good energy on that show. He's supposed to be like this boss who, at the end of the day, is like on their side, but is still a huge prick in every episode. <laughs> It is, like, only yeah. real friend. I, I remember Big Time Rush being... Because there was, like, the two boy band shows at the time. There was Big Time Rush and then the Jonas Brothers. Um, and Big Time Rush was, think... like... It was funny because it was... 
it probably wasn't nearly it wasn't nearly as big as the Jonas Brothers craze, but it was like each channel had their boy band TV show, you know. But I I feel like no one watched the Jonas Brothers show. I feel like everyone was like into the Jonas Brothers as a band, but no one cared that much about the show. I have or no Big idea. Time Rush. I I kind of hated Big Time Rush as a band. I thought their music was annoying. I still watched the show. The show was funny because it was the same people who did Ned's Declassified. It was a funny show. Um, yeah, yeah. The show, the show, like treated itself like a show and not a commercial for a band, even though it was a commercial for a band. To to be fair, I I don't I didn't like hate hate Big Time Rush. I just hated that their music played every single fucking commercial break on Nickelodeon. I got so <laughs> sick of hearing it. I'm like, stop, stop. I feel I feel the same way about like. All of the high school musical songs. Right. They would always play those during commercial. And I'm like, I don't care. I don't want to hear this again. I don't want to hear it again. One of their songs is like a joke song in my family. So it's like made it onto like vacation videos I've done for them. But like, yeah, he he's good on that. And I'm going to say this for Alvin Fling. I don't know if it'd be nearly as funny if anyone else did it. I can't say he did a good job, but he... It's really, the voice he gave him is really funny. It's, like, really irritating, but that enhances the scenes. Like I said, the scene where she's crying on the couch, the the fact that his voice is yeah, as mean, annoying as it is does add a lot to the humor. I it, Again, like, it seemed like he improvised a lot of these, and yeah. most of them are not good jokes, but just the way they are inserted into the movie is very funny. Because, like, it, it never seems like the dog is actually thinking these things. Right. And some of them are just, like, so out of pocket. You're like, what the fuck? Don't touch me. I'm like, not gay. <laughs> hey, I'm not gay. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's like, I'm not gay. <laughs> and it's just like, he's petting a dog, dude. Chill out. <laughs> It, it, gen it genuinely seemed like he just sort of, like, rattled off some jokes, and then they used every single one of them. And it's made it's made extra hilarious by the fact that there is no music in this movie. Oh my they god. They did not put music in this movie. And so, that, that creates a, a bunch of problems. But with him specifically, they also didn't do, like, noise reduction, so it'll be, like, dead silence. Hey, I'm a dog. You know what's so funny about that? So many times watching this movie, because when we're in these Discord calls, like watching these, um, you like you have press to talk on because you're watching on your TV. So so many times, I, when I heard that, I was like, "Is Matt?" I was like, "Oh, Matt's about to say something." And there was even once or twice where it's like, "Wait, did Matt just say that, or did someone in the movie say that?" Because it's just like condition. Like I hear the fucking background static noise pop up and it's just but no it's just actually the movie and that's like it is hands down the worst sound editing i've seen in a movie ever <laughs> yes um yes and it's so much worse that there's just no music there because clearly clearly it was edited to have music yeah and it just doesn't even like the generic ass kevin mcleod shit that was in a talking cat would have been an improvement. Yeah, and it's free. Although, Just put it in. Although I kind of think it's like hilarious that there's no music. Oh yeah, it's oh this like is something I, we said during the movie. It's a Dogma ninety five movie. <laughs> yeah, no, it it hits seven of the ten requirements to be a Dogma ninety five movie. And how many did uh, Lars von Trier and um. Oh, what's his fucking name? I like his movies more. Vinterberg. Vinterberg. Thomas Vinterberg. Yeah, Thomas Vinterberg. What, how many did they break? Because they might be on equal playing field here. I think the only one they consistently broke was uh, crediting themselves in their movies. Mm -hmm. Alright, well, look, all she needs to do is make a video confessing which rules she broke, and then it's a dogma movie. Yeah. I, I like the only the she's credited. Uh, it's not shot on film; it's digital, and they do use like effects in the movie. They do use filters and effects, but only for the lake scene. Like when he's talking to the witch of the lake, it's like sparkle effects. Right. Also, can we talk about how many duck transitions there are? A lot. Just like every every time it cuts to a new scene, it's like ducks. New scene. I was gonna say one more thing about Steven. 
as Alvin Flang. I'll say this much. Um, like I said, Big Time Rush does a good job there. Alvin Flang, it's really funny. I can't really hold that performance against him. And I'll also say this, he did an interview with Ralph after Ralph made a video making fun of the movie, so I'll give him, I'll, I'll, he has my respect for that, he was a good sport about it, seems like I, a cool dude. I should have watched that interview before we, we did this, but oh um, well. I, I watched it a few years ago when it came out, go ahead. He was in the movie Storks, which was pretty good, I really liked Storks. Uh, you know what else he was in? And like... And he's he's not even like a minor character. He's like a pretty major character in that movie. I'd like to see Storks. You know who else he vo- whoever uh, what other movie he was in? He was in the forty one year old virgin who knocked up Sarah Marshall and felt super bad about it. So a little you're losing a little bit of respect there for that one. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alvin Fleng is definitely more. I don't you know I I don't even know anything about the movie. I just know those fucking parody movies where the title is really long. Like this was like this was after. Freeberg and Seltzer. Yeah. Like, it, it, it was just... It, it, they have that, like, really long Star Wars movie, too. But no, in all seriousness, yeah, that guy, an interesting fella. We should... Yeah, no, should, I, we talk, uh, should we talk about any of the other cast members? Like, at least the main, our female lead? Um, I mean, the, the acting in this, apart from uh, our friend Steven, uh, it's mostly pretty bad. But uh, honestly, it's not even like, li- like, like in a talking cat, every single actor is bringing some special badness to the table. In this movie, it's just kind of like, okay, they were like amateurs. They're right. trying, but they're not very good at what they're doing. Yeah, uh, that is something with like um, a talking cat as it does kind of feel like everyone's trying, but they're just like awkward actors. But they're all trying, and they do have, like, a little bit of charisma because of that. It's like, I don't know, it's like going to see a, like, a corny stage show, you know? Like, oh, it's like public, it's like going to see something like a public theater or something. Yeah. Where this one's more so, like, your friend's uh, YouTube video. Her, her house and her wardrobe are, like, aggressively green, and, like, specifically chartreuse. It reminds me of my grandma. My grandmother's favorite color is chartreuse, although she doesn't paint her entire house that color and wear it every single day. <sighs> she took inspiration from the locations in the Cat, a- Cat in the Hat live action movie. <laughs> I found a movie call, uh, that seems to be inspired by Love on a Leash called Love and Leashes. It has huh. potential, right? Maybe. <laughs> it's one of the recommended movies for Love on a Leash. Well, do you have anything else to say about Love on a Leash or A Talking Cat? Not really. Um, I, yeah, Love on, uh, just to repeat my one thought, Love on a Leash, it's not, it does not maintain its entertainment value, but it's still pretty funny as a whole. I'd recommend watching it once. I don't know if I'd want to watch it again with anyone. It's not that, it's just A Talking Cat, I, yeah. I would... I would watch it again with people, even if it kind of if it kind of loses the novelty after the first like I don't know forty minutes. But also, then there's like the what the fuck ending. So I think there's a especially like you and I were like sitting down focusing on it for for like a podcast. I think if you just had like friends over and you were hanging out, you could like point and laugh at a lot of this. And then when it's you start to lose interest, you can just kind of like chit chat do whatever and then like when the ending comes on you're gonna be like what again so yeah i I think this is good for like a group of people especially if you know they're maybe not gonna be paying complete attention to the movie right all right well i guess if we've made it to uh the portion of the video where we're voting i think i voted first last time so i'll let you start I'm gonna give it to uh, Talking Cat. Um, yeah, I think it just maintains its entertainment longer, like I just said, and also it is like technically better made, even though that's not something I'm gonna compliment it on. Um, but it, yeah, yeah it, it does have music in there. It does have better audio editing. It is shot better. But these are not things it does well. Yeah, I honestly like. Before we sat down to record, I was genuinely like, I have no clue which one of these I'm going to vote for. 
I had one I was leaning towards, but I'm like, let's see where the conversation goes. And honestly, I, I think I'm going with the one I was actually not leaning towards, uh, which is a talking cat. Um, I think it's it's like just a little funnier and also it is technically better made. Although I, I, to, to love on a leash's defense, I like a talking cat feels like, Someone who knew what they were doing but didn't care that much. Where Love on a Leash feels like it was someone who just had no idea what they were doing. Had no idea how to make a movie and was just like winging it. Yeah. And I think I, there is a charm to that. I, I yeah. will almost respect the filmmaking more for Love on a Leash. Even though it is technically worse. I, 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 I feel like... I feel like the people making A Talking Cat could have done better. I don't know that the people making Love on a Leash could have done better. <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's a good point. The audience is with us. It's 74% for A Talking Cat, 26% for Love on a Leash. Blue Bidia Game says A Talking Cat is better, in quotes. <laughs> <laughs> Which, yeah, that is, that's what this series is. Thank you for noticing. Uh... A talking cat wins! Alright. Um, next month is Halloween. So for our Halloween episode... It's it's actually kind of going to be similar to, to the last matchup we did where it's two remakes from... Two remakes of films from the same director. Uh, this time, Master of Horror, John Carpenter. Now, unlike last time... It will not be boring remakes, it will be kind of infuriating remakes. Oh no. It's 2008's Halloween versus 2011's The Thing. Ugh, oh, alrighty. I knew that one was coming eventually. Alright, let's, I, I love The Thing. Um, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I don't know if you want to do Out of Ring on those two, but I, I have already seen both. It's one of the few times where I've actually seen both of the movies we're doing the recover, the remake on. Uh yeah, I we could do we could absolutely do an out of the ring on the thing, or Halloween. Um, I am kind of tempted to to make it <laughs> Lords of Salem because Rob Zombie directed the Halloween remake and like I f like Rob Zombie has become kind of like an easy punching bag for horror fans and I think he's made some really good movies. I like Rob Zombie as a director. And I think Halloween is a big part of why he has a bad reputation. <laughs> so, I kind of want to do, like, Lords of Salem just to be like, here's a good Rob Zombie movie. He can direct a movie. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know, up to you. What do you, what do you want to watch? Halloween, The Thing, Lords of Salem? Let's do, I mean, I, honestly, I say let's do Lord, Lord of Salem just because it's something I haven't seen yet. Hell yeah. If you didn't pick it, I would have made it like my Halloween movie night pick, but... Plus, we could talk about the originals in the Hollow Victories episode. Absolutely. Alright, so I, I guess out of the ring on Lords of Salem. Woo! And, uh... Look forward to the Halloween versus The Thing episode next month. Yeah. Um, anything else? Nah, I think that, that just about wraps it up. Alrighty then. Well, from my co-host Mackle Shadackle, I am Matt Presents. We will see you in the next one. Peace.